Welcome to Seattle. Sorry I couldn't do more about the weather. We tried, put a word in, but uh, unfortunately. So you won't believe this, but it has been absolutely gorgeous here for the last <laughs> couple of days. So you'll want to stay in the hotel during the next couple of days while it's raining. So it is a great pleasure to, to welcome you here um, uh, to help launch this event. I've been looking forward to this for months, along with Suzanne, great team of folks who have put it together. You know, if I think about this event, it really represents a decade, really, of, of, of innovation and dedicated effort on widening and strengthening the bridge to opportunity, which is higher education in this country. And our progress, I'm in awe of our progress. If you think about it, our progress is evident in the fact of the diversity of our student body, which grows day by day to look more and more like the diverse people of this country. Our progress is apparent in the fact that over the last 10 years, while we've opened the doors of higher education and fundamentally changed the nature of its student body, we're not just concentrating on access to an education, but on the completion of a college credential. Because we know that in this country, a college credential leads to a healthy and a productive and a contributing and sustaining life. Our progress is evident in the fact that the President of these United States is urging action on us to drive the attainment agenda in this country. Our progress is evident in the fact that in this presidential election campaign, candidates are debating competing visions for the future of higher education. Our progress is apparent in the fact that more and more Americans realize that higher education is the surest path to life-changing opportunity. It's a ticket into the middle class. In survey after survey, the vast majority of American parents, rich and poor, black, white, and brown, the vast majority of American parents see college in the future for their children. And they know that college is also essential to our continued economic strength and development as a nation. In 2025, 65% of all jobs in this country will require some form of post-secondary credentials. Today, right now, only about 40% of adults have some kind of post-secondary credential. Our progress is apparent in this coalescence that we've seen really in the last two or three or four years around a number of high impact innovations, high impact because they appear to work when implemented with fidelity and care, they appear to work time and time again to improve the chance of success for all our students. Innovations like technology that can deliver a personalized learning at tremendous scale. Innovations like highly structured educational pathways, which enable students to complete a college credential almost independent of where and how they started. Financial aid ensures that college remains affordable, targets aid to the neediest of our students, and can be distributed in ways which encourages success, not just access. And data, you'd expect that, it's the Gates Foundation. Data. Because data, when produced in a standard form, creates the information that students and you as higher education leaders and policymakers need to make good decisions about how education in this country is accessed, how it's delivered, and how it's financed. But the greatest progress that we have made in this decade, in my view, is represented here in this room, in you, in the work that you're doing, the innovation that you're driving. You exist at the forefront of a movement in higher education which is fundamentally, potentially transforming this industry for the good of this country. You come, most of you, from colleges and universities and systems which are fundamentally transforming themselves in the interest of your students in the interest of our country. 
or you come from organizations which assist those colleges in that work. You have set yourselves tremendously audacious goals. So I'm looking around the room and I'm recalling conversations that I've had with you or with your colleagues or your presidents. Conversations about double digit increases in your student retention and graduation rate. Conversations about the elimination of the attainment gap between rich and poor, between black, white, and brown students. The elimination of the attainment gap, not the reduction of the attainment gap. Conversations about how to achieve these goals without increasing selectivity at admission. You folks, you're not just seeking to outperform your peers. You're developing entirely new educational models in the interest of your students. Models that address our access and completion challenges, not just pay lip service to them. You're not racing after every fad in reform. You're focusing on innovations that are proven to work, that have evidence behind them, and you're integrating them into the fabric of your enterprise. Not in tests and pilots, but rolling things out at scale, because you know that only by rolling innovation out at scale, even where it forces fundamental change in the nature of your enterprise, only by operating at scale can you achieve the audacious goals that you have set yourself. You are not afraid of change. You embrace it. You defy convention. You set new standards. You seem to be operating with vision, with grit, with determination in a world which is constantly changing and in a period of continuing fiscal uncertainty. Many of you are redesigning your entire enterprises so that they focus entirely and exclusively on your students and their success and you're using data to drive your performance and your continuous improvement. You are measuring your performance not on the basis of who you exclude, but on the basis of who you include and how well they succeed. And you're setting tremendously different high levels of transparency as you publish data about yourself, about your institutions, about their progress, about the progress of your students. Data which testify to your many successes, but also illuminate continuing challenges that you face. So kudos to you. It is because of what you do that I am enormously honored to work in your presence. And we are proud as a foundation to be partners with you in this endeavor. So why are you here? Why are we here? We're here because we know that this work is not done. That work strengthening widening the bridge to opportunity, which is high, higher education in this country, there is more to do. For far too many, that bridge is too narrow. The path across it is unnecessarily complex, and the toll is too high. You're here, we're here, because we refuse to accept the status quo. We refuse to accept a world in which nearly half of all students who begin college fail to complete a college credential. We refuse to accept a status quo where one in 10, one in 10 lowest income students, one in 10, will acquire a college degree by the age of 24. And what did Suzanne say? Those who are least likely to acquire a degree before in school will end up also poor. We're here because we recognize that this country is at a fork in the road. Either we embrace innovation and make the difficult choices that we need to make to re-inject into higher education opportunity, or we will sit idly by and watch colleges and universities in this country become yet another wedge that drive even greater inequality in our society. Our presence here 
is a resounding vote for opportunity. And we're here because over the last 18 months, working together with you, with one another, we came up with this collectively, it's a technical term, crazy ass idea, <laughs> that if institutions who are way out in front in terms of the effort that they're putting in fundamentally transforming their work in the interests of their students, if those institutions are able to get together, to learn together, to share what's working and what's not, to learn in public, to learn with one another across the usual boundaries which somehow define our association, that we will create this international interaction effect. And so here we are. HBCUs, state systems, community colleges, Comprehensive, urban serving universities, research universities, wholly new startups, didn't exist five or six years ago. I'm sure I'm missing whole independent. What you share is the drive and the passion and the track record and the willingness to fundamentally rethink what it is we do in order to serve your students and our country. The idea is that in this collection, we can create an interaction effect. That interaction effect will be an accelerant, both inside your institutions and beyond. Learning from one another about what works and what doesn't, you will accomplish your goals more quickly. But you will also set an example for others, inspire others to follow. Injecting a spirit of healthy competition into this industry, competition that orients around student success, not student amenity. That interaction effect ultimately can amplify a transformational movement that you've already begun as our scale and our number and our momentum and our impact grow to create a ripple effect across the industry to the benefit of our economy, our communities, and our families. So I'm an American historian by training, licensed, certified by properly accredited institutions, minted back in 1980-something, give away my age. And I'm just as comfortable looking back as I am looking forward. And when I look back across the arc of American history, I see that transformational movements are themselves the results of interaction effects. They result from the interaction of people and ideas and time. And with respect to the transformation in higher education, I believe that you are the people you have the ideas, and that now, now is your time. So I thank you very much. I thank you very much for joining us over the next couple of days. I look forward to having an opportunity to speak with many of you, I hope, um, and to uh, working with you, sustaining the course over the years ahead.